Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, got a couple things in the mail today. We're going to get to the study real quick, but this was on the desk because I haven't done anything with it. I went ahead and bought the uh, Jerusalem flag. And I wanted to mainly do the emblem. A brother in Christ did a great study on the emblem and how it prophesies Jesus Christ, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And it was a good study. It was a really good study. Um, so I bought this to put on the wall somewhere to remind myself that uh, the reason we pray for the peace of Jerusalem is not because we want the peace, the peace like, you know, today for them to be peaceful. My prayer for the Jewish people today is that they get saved and born again the King James Bible way. The proper way. The only way. Okay? That they get saved and born again. But when world peace comes, it's coming to Jerusalem first. Okay? That's where Jesus is coming back and he's starting his rule and his reign. So I remember this. I had this on the desk. haven't got it out yet. Um, and then this. I don't know if you've been noticing. I've been trying to keep it a little bit secret, but I don't know if you've noticed. It might happen now, but this chair that I'm sitting in as I'm preaching uh, the Word of God, it tends, the hydraulics, it tends to slowly sink. It almost reminds me when I've, we did our walk and talks on my driveway that goes down a little bit and we're standing there. Not walk and talks, but we stand there and do some of the preaching on the driveway. That because of my back, I started shifting left and right. And as I started shifting left and right in one of the videos, I started out back a ways. But I kept stepping forward a little bit as I was shifting to try to ease my back as I was preaching. And I got so close to the video by the time we were done with that preaching. I was really close to the camera. I mean the video with the camera. Um, but this, you can see some of the preaching that my head where it's at compared to the banner. And then all of a sudden it gets a little bit lower, a little bit lower, a little bit lower. Sometimes it doesn't, but this chair is sinking, so I had to buy a whole new hydraulic that i got to get put in here in the next couple days. Uh, just came in yesterday. Both of these came in yesterday. Yeah, yesterday. I'm trying to remember if it was yesterday or the day before. But we got those two things. That being said, brothers and sisters Christ, who's ready for a Bible study? Not a, not a talk show, not a reaction show, but a solid Bible study. Comparing scripture with scripture. Right. If you're ready for a Bible study, you're in the right place. Because that's what we're going to do today. So get out your King James Bibles. And remember, you can pause the video and you can turn in the, in the video. If I don't turn there myself, because i got all the scriptures printed out here, I'm a very slow turner. Some preachers, they get up there, they can turn pretty fast. Either that or they hardly use any scripture. But some of them do use a lot of scripture and they just, they, they're quick turners. Uh, I'm just kind of slow, so to keep the videos from being super, super long, I've just been telling the brethren to pause the video, turn to the scripture I mentioned, and I'm going to be reading it off my notes. But we will be turning to a couple places in the Bible, because we're going to be reading some stories. So today, acknowledge him in all thy ways, we're going to be talking about Moses. What's, what, what started these studies for me, brothers and Christ, to share with you is Proverbs 3.5. Proverbs 3.5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. We're going to break this down into two parts. There's two times that Moses really failed the Lord. The big times, I believe. One had to do with not trusting the Lord with all thine heart, but he was leaning on his own understanding. And the other time, he was not acknowledging the Lord in all his ways. And God even directed him on what to do, but he didn't acknowledge the Lord in all his ways. And we're going to talk about what got in the way of him acknowledging the Lord. Okay? And remember, acknowledge, Webster's 1828 Dictionary, to own or notice with particular regard. In other words, to make the Lord in his way the foundation of all your ways. When you're going to the Lord and you're seeking the Lord, you're acknowledging him in everything you do, this is how you acknowledge him. Lord, am I supposed to be doing this? Lord, can I do this? Lord, I say it a lot. If, if, if it be your will, Lord, I'd like to get this done today. Lord, if it be your will, I'd like to get that done today. Lord, please protect me. Lord, what do you think of this? Lord, please, you know, we pray and we ask God for guidance when it comes to opening the scriptures to us. If any of you lack knowledge, let him ask God that give it to all men liberally and brave not, and it shall be given to him. Pray without ceasing. We're supposed to acknowledge him in everything that we do, brothers and Christ, everything. Um, are you holding anything back? Are you trying to keep something from the Lord? Okay. 
That's a question I, I did a little on my channel under, I think, the comment section. There's no comment section anymore. I forgot what it's called, but there's a little section where you can... I, can, I did a little picture of a graph that shows the average person's life, how much time they spend sleeping, eating, work, this, that, this, and just shows a timeline of all this stuff, and God's not mentioned at all. And I'm like, are you acknowledging Him in all your ways? Are you trying to keep stuff back from the Lord? Okay. Romans 3, 4 says, God forbid, Romans 3, 4, says, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as is written, that thou might be justified in thy sayings, and my soul will come when thou art judged. Let God be true. How do we get our answers most of the time today? Is this right here. When we ask God, is this okay to do? He shows us in the scripture. That's okay. That's not okay. This is what you're supposed to be doing. That's not what you're supposed to be doing. Okay, we acknowledge him in all our ways. And he will direct our steps. And this is how we do it. Bible studies. Learning the word of God. Staying in the word of God. Are you starting your days with the Word of God and ending your day with the Word of God, brothers and sisters in Christ? Very important. Right. How many times do you get through this Bible every year? It's a good question. I'm not going to answer it for me, and I'm not going to answer it for you. But, Brother Chris, ask yourself, how often do I get through this entire book every, every year? How often? Today it's easy. you got Alexander Scorvey that reads the Bible for you. You sit down and if you start your days and end your days with the Word of God, it's easy to get through this. In the old days, you just had to read, 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 read. Okay. And in the old days, you had to work harder. Today, give me a second. Today, before I forget, <laughs> I always do sometimes, so we don't get interrupted again. <laughs> but uh, today, because of technology and everything, we have a lot of free times on our hands. A lot of free time on our hands. Where are you spending your free time, brothers and sisters Christ? Here? That's where you should start spending a lot of your free time. I understand fathers spending their free times with their children and wives, and mothers spending their time with their husband, free time with their husband and their children and everything. I understand that. But praising God. You need to be spending a lot of your free time in this, too. Right? This should take priority. Okay? But let God be true and every man a liar. Psalms 33, 11. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. Acknowledge him in all thy ways, and he shall direct thy steps. Trust the Lord with all thine heart, and lead not on thine own understanding. So what gets in the way of acknowledging the Lord in all your ways? That's what this whole study is about, these series of studies. We're going to go through men, great men of God and find out where they failed God and find out that they didn't either trust the Lord with all their heart or they didn't acknowledge him in all their ways. Something got in the way, and we're going to be talking about that. We'll be continuing a series of studies showing great men in the Bible and where they failed to acknowledge the Lord and what got in the way of doing it. Remember 2 Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works. We're using this for, we're going to the Old Testament for instruction and righteousness, and if you're failing God the same way, it's a correction for you to get your heart right with the Lord. All right. I got this hat on, <laughs> it got in the way a little bit. I'm dressed like this, Brother Jesus Christ, because I open my windows at night, that's my AC. I open my windows at night, it cools down the house, and then I close them during the day, and it's ice cold first thing in the morning in, in, in the house. So I got all this on because it's actually cold in the house. All right. But we're going to be doing this for instruction and righteousness. And Romans 15, 4 says, For what sort of things were written aforetime were written for our learning. We can learn from mistakes in the past. The people, when brethren make mistakes, I say brethren, but saints of the Old Testament, great men of God in the Old Testament, when lost people in the Old Testament make mistakes, you know, we can learn from the Old Testament. That through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Living a, remember, looking for that blessed hope, brother says Christ, is living a life of Christ. True looking for it. It's not sitting out on the deck, even though I do it sometimes. It's not sitting out on the deck and looking up at the clouds going, Oh Lord, is today the day? Is today the day? I do that too. But the Bible teaches that looking for that blessed hope is living a life of Christ. And if you're learning 
from this book, and you're taking this book, the Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. If you're taking the word of God, hiding in your heart, and you're living it, you're looking for that hope, that blessed hope, that we might have hope. Okay? So let's get into this. Get your King James Bibles out. I already said that. King, King, King James Bibles out. It's King James Bible believers. It's God's perfect written word in English. Get rid of all those Bible perversions, the Catholic Bibles, the Antichrist Bibles, and get yourself a King James Bible if you don't have one. If you don't have one, email the ministry. I've been getting emails, a lot of requests for King James Bibles. Mm -hmm. Email the ministry. Uh, it's in the description section, our email address. Or this email address, and I will get you a King James Bible if God gives me the, the ability. Um, there's brethren over in Belgium that I'm getting them four to five Bibles a month, and I, I'm behind. I'm trying to get caught up with the requests as best I can. But I will do my best to get you a King James Bible. Okay. But get a King James Bible out and turn to Exodus chapter 4. That's where we're going to start. And we're going to start out with the first part of um, Proverbs 3, 5, okay, and Moses' life. Remember, there's two areas that I want to show you that Moses failed the Lord. And this first part is going to be, Trust the Lord with all thine heart and lean not on thine own understanding. Okay, so let's get to Exodus chapter 4. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, do. Deuteronomy. Do you remember those? Old, they came up with a good song to help you memorize all the books in the Old Bible and on the Old Testament and into the New Testament. But I started trying to memorize all the orders. Sometimes I still forget. Sometimes I get it and I praise God for it, praise Him for it. Okay. So we're looking for Exodus chapter 4. At the very beginning of Exodus. Now you have Moses, he fled from Pharaoh, he, he came out of Egypt, you know, he's, he's got a wife and everything, and he goes up and he, he, he sees a, a cave, he goes up there, he sees a burning, a bush that's burning, and he's going in and he's talking with the Lord, okay, and the Lord's going to be giving him a command, okay, he's acknowledging the Lord, and the Lord's directing him saying, this is what I want you to do, but something gets in the way of him trusting the Lord. So let's read this. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me. Because Jesus, I believe it's Jesus in the bush, God in the bush, is telling him you need to go to Israel, or to Israel, Egypt, and you need to, you know, preach what I tell you to preach to get my people out of Egypt. And he's talking about the, the, the Jewish leaders, the elders, and everything they won't listen to him. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is in thy that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And as he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses fled from it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand, and take it by the tail. And he put it forth his hand, and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. Now remember, Jews require a sign. Greeks seek after wisdom. Okay? To the Jewish people, speaking isn't enough. They require a sign. Signs and wonders. That came in his hand, that they may believe that the Lord God of their, of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath appeared unto thee. And the Lord said furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into, into his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, Put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again, and plucked it out of his bosom, and behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, the voice of the first sign, the stick turning to a snake, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. It uses the word voice. This is important, because God's saying, I'm sending you, to be my voice to the people. 
The one thing I always kick when you read the Bible a little bit, and I'm like these, the Jewish people, they always say uh, the laws of Moses. And we do too sometimes, but if you want to be accurate, it's God's laws through Moses. God is speaking through Moses. Moses is, the, is being the voice of God to the people. Okay, But they'll give Moses all the credit. They'll give Moses all the glory. And that's the whole point of this. They won't believe me, Lord. They won't believe me at all. So God's like, I'm going to work through you, and I'm going to speak through you through signs, not just words, but signs. Okay? And it came to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take of the water of the river, and pour it upon the dry land, and the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon dry land. Okay? So bah, real quick, recap. God's saying, okay, I'm sending you to do my work for me. This is what I want you to do. I need you to go here and I need you to preach to these people. Okay. What's Moses' response? And Moses said unto the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither here, here to fore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech, and I am slow of tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Why hath, Who hath made mouths, man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or seeing, or the blind? Have not I, saith the Lord? Have not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. Okay. Moses starts doubting himself, and God says, I'll be with you. I'm going to be speaking through you, whether it be through words, or through signs and wonders. I will speak through you. I'll give you the right words. What does Moses do? And 13 says, And he said, O oh my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. What's going on here? He's not trusting the Lord with all his heart. He's too fixated on his own understanding. And lean not on thine own understanding. He's too fixated on himself and his inadequacies, what he believes is inadequacies. And how does God respond? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, because Moses wasn't trusting him. Moses was relying on his own strength, his own abilities, and he's like, I, I can't do it. God said, I, I, I'm telling you, you can do it, because I will do it for you. I will be your strength. I will be your words. I still, well, Lord, you know, send whom you will send, but, you know, he's still doubting and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, it's, Is not Aaron and the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well, and also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, and when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. Okay. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. This is one time Moses failed the Lord because he didn't, like greatly, to the point where God got angry with him. Which leads us into the second part. But God got angry with him, with a cause. God said, I will do it. Look at this. You saw the miracles. I will be speaking through you. And he still doubted. He didn't trust the Lord. Now, what this reminds me of is Acts. You don't, uh, don't have to turn turn to Acts 10. Yeah, go ahead and turn to Acts 10. But Acts 10, 20, you have, Arise, therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. This is Peter. Peter's being sent to a Gentile home. Okay. Arise, therefore, and get thee down. And Acts eleven twelve. And the Spirit bade me go with him. This is when Paul's trying to, or Peter is trying to rehearse the story because he's got to explain to the his fellow Jews what he was doing hanging out with Gentiles. So he had to rehearse it, and he said, "And the Spirit bade me to go with them, nothing doubting, nothing doubting." Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. Now, we're going to turn to Acts chapter 10. Turn to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Okay. You have Cornelius, okay? a centurion of the band called the Italian band, had a vision to send for Peter, and he was a Gentile. And the whole thing is they're not supposed to hang out with Gentiles, fellowship with Gentiles. Okay. And remember, Jews are not to fellowship with Gentiles. 
hang out with them, <laughs> fellowship with them, talk with them. You know, they can do business dealings, transactions, and stuff like that, but they're not supposed to be like hanging out with them, fellowshipping with them. Now, Acts 10, go to verse 9. I'm going to start in verse 9. On the morrow, as they went on their journey, drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they, were re while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven open, and a certain vessel descended unto him, as it had, pardon me, as it had been a great sheet knit at four corners, and let down to the earth. Wherein were all matters of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessels was received up again into heaven. This is God showing Peter that, hey, salvation's gone out to the world. It's, it's the time, we're going into the time of the Gentiles. Salvation is going out to the world. That salvation is no longer just of the Jews. But what's Peter's response? Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen would mean, he's like, I don't get it. I don't get it. Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore, go thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing. Remember, he was doubting to where this would go. God sets him straight. Doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent to him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am, he, I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause before ye are come? And then they tell the story about Cornelius having the vision. Having the, vision. the angel telling him, Go seek Peter. Peter going to him. All right. Now, remember, Proverbs 3, 5, Trust the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not on thine own understanding. Now, Peter, in this story, Peter trusted the Lord, and if you keep reading, he went. He didn't give a fuss. He didn't put up a fight. And you got to understand how serious this was. You have Moses trying to go deal with the Jewish people. He fled from his, uh, Egypt and, and his people, and he fled out. Right. Here you have Peter. He, cause he was preaching the gospel to the Jewish people. The, I believe primarily he starts out with the gospel of the kingdom of heaven, and then it slowly transfers over to the gospel that we have today that's revealed to, to Paul. But when it, he got told, hey, you've got to go preach to those, Jew, to those Gentiles, uh-oh, this is a serious thing. I'm not supposed to be caught with, the, with Gentiles, hanging out with Gentiles. Okay. But God, I remember you saying salvation is only of the Jews and the gospels. And God's trying to show them, nope, now salvation's going out to the world. It's a big issue. Peter trusted the Lord and went without a fuss. He doubted at first where this vision would go, and then God set him straight and said, doubting nothing. And he went. He went. Now, on his way back, he was rehearsing hardcore. Okay, how am I going to explain this to, to my fellow Jews, my brother, brethren? How am I going to explain this? And he has to rehearse it, you know. Now, while Moses kept leaning on his own understanding to the point it angered God, self-doubt and focusing on your own limitations, abilities, and strength can get in the way of you trusting the Lord with all your heart. Brother and Christ, how, how many times do you look at something and say, I can't do this. I can't do this. When I first got saved, it's, it's always, some people seem to be very outgoing. I wasn't. When I first got saved, I was like, you want me to go out and, and try to, you know, preach the gospel and and hand out gospel tracts. Some of us are very quiet, you know, kind of shy, kind of have a private life type thing. It's like, you want me to go out there? I can't do that, Lord. I, I don't have the, I, I, I don't, I'm not a people person, Lord. I, I, I don't have the courage, Lord, that some other people do. Are, are you sure you want me to do that, Lord? We start doubting what the Lord wants us to do. We're all called into the ministry of reconciliation. You might not be called to be one of the street preachers 
evangelists, and mainly men, only men are evangelists, but you might not be called to be standing out there as an evangelist and preaching the gospel out of court, but we're all called in the ministry of reconciliation. I always encourage you, brothers and Christ, to leave gospel tracts everywhere you go. And when the door opens, you, I always pray that God gives me the courage to stand. Remember Paul talking about praying that, pray that I might be bold, that I might preach the gospel? He was praying for courage, asking the brethren to pray for him to have courage, to speak the truth no matter what, to stand for the truth no matter what. But there's a lot of times things get in our way, uh, our flesh. There's times, Lord, I've tried. I've tried to give this sin up for you. I just can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. Me, me, me. I, I, I. In my testimony, I told the brethren, I said, when it came to Hollywood movies, TV shows, and video games, and porn, those were my four, four addictions that I had before I got saved. And I struggled with them for several years after getting saved. And when I stopped fighting God because I was trying to do it on my own power, my own strength, and I submitted myself to the Lord completely, they just happened to just, they're gone. Uh, I, over time, they just faded out of my life and, and they're, they're gone. I'm not doing that stuff anymore. Why? Because I trusted the Lord with all my heart. And I didn't lean on my own understanding. You know, these people, I tried to kick this, I tried to kick that. Oh, I tried to do this, and I tried to... Are you trusting the Lord with all your heart when you're doing these things? Or are you thinking to yourself, I can do this, I can do it. Because when Moses is like, can I do this? No, I can't do this. He started doubting. Okay. Brothers and Christ, doubt at your own physical limitations and getting stuck on what you can see. Remember, lean not on your own understanding. Why? Because God's way is higher than our way. He sees what we don't see. And He will give us the strength, brother says Christ. He'll give us the strength. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Through Christ. Are you trying to go through your own strength, your own understanding, your own, own abilities? Like your own, I can do this. How many times do we tell God when we desperately need God's help, we say, Lord, we need your help. I need your help with this. And God starts helping us with it. And when things seem to be going easy, we're like, okay, God, okay, God, I got this. Okay, it's great. I got this. I got this. And then we fall flat on our face again. Someone said once it was like children. When you're teaching a child how to do something, when you first start teaching them, they need to set the, stand there or sit there and be quiet. They need to listen and they need to watch what you're doing. And the first thing the child does when you're trying to fix a toy or you're trying to do something for them, the first thing they do when they see you do the first step, they come in their head, oh, I can do this, and they try to take over. And you've got to tell them, no, you're just set there and you're going to watch me do this completely from step one to the last step. Okay, now do you got it? Okay, now it's your turn to do it. But their first thing is they want to jump in there and do it right then and there and take over, take over, take over. Oh, that's easy. That looks easy. I can do it. I can do it. We need to be patient. I can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me. We need to make sure we're going through Jesus Christ first and foremost. Okay. Hebrews 11, 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Moses was doubting. He was looking within himself. I can't do this. He wasn't looking to God saying, Lord, Give me the strength to do this. Lord, if you say I can do this, I can do this. Remember we just got the, the study before, we were talking about um, Joshua. When it came to the, the walls of Jericho, he's like, listen people, if God says we can do this, we can do this. Oh, by the way, God, how do we do this? Right? It's trusting the Lord. When God told Moses, you can do this, and I'm sending you, I have chosen you, and you're going to go do this, and you can do this, Moses kept doubting him to the point it angered the Lord. When God calls you to do something for him and to live for him, he will give you the strength and the means to do it, brother says Christ. You know what gets in the way? Doubt. A lot of things, the flesh, the world, Satan, the three enemies. But so one of the things that can really get in our way is that our flesh can try to get us to doubt whether we can do it or not. The world comes in and tries to get you to doubt whether you're capable of doing it. Or should be doing it. 
whether it's the ministry of reconciliation, getting sin out of your life, sanctification, standing for the word of God, helping brethren out. You know, Satan comes in, tries to, you know, get you to doubt yourself. When God calls you, us to salvation, he'll give us a book. He gives us the Holy Spirit to open this book to us, and he'll give us the strength to live a life of Christ, to be in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you feel like you're getting called into ministry, men getting called into ministry, God will give you the strength to do it. Okay? He'll, he'll give you the means to do it. What always seems to get in the way is our self-doubt. Okay? Okay, now let's get into Proverbs 3, 6. Okay, turn to Numbers 20. Okay, turn to Numbers 20. But we're going to get into Proverbs 3, 6. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths in Moses. The first mistake I believe he made is he didn't trust the Lord with all his heart when it came to God calling him to preach to his, his brethren in Egypt. Okay? The second time that Moses, I believe big time Moses failed the Lord... We're going to get into that here. Okay. But as you're turning to Exodus chapter 20, okay, Exodus 7, 16, here's the first time. Exodus 17, 16. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of, of the elders of Israel. The first time they needed water really bad, he struck the rock once. It, showed, it just says he, he smite the rock, singular, once. The second time, Numbers 28, Take the, the rod and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before, before their eyes, and it shall give forth its water, his water, and give forth his water, his water, <laughs> God's water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, so that thou shalt give the congregation and the beast drink. No, it says, speak unto the rock. So what happened there? Remember, we're going to be going off of acknowledging the Lord in all thy ways, and he shall direct thy paths. X, uh, Numbers 20. Let's get to Numbers. Numbers chapter 20. Right, we're going to be reading 1 through 13. Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, to the desert of Zin in the first month, and the people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam died there, and was buried there. And there was no water for the congregation, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. Now, I might be getting ahead of myself a little bit, but if you read through the Bible, you'll see that Moses is getting so angry and frustrated with the people. One minute, God provides for them. They just, they're not trusting God. They're not relying on God. They are not acknowledging, trusting the Lord with all their heart, and lean, they keep leaning on their own understanding. And they are not acknowledging the Lord in all their ways, and He shall direct their steps. They keep turning to Moses and Aaron. This is your fault. This is your fault. This is your fault. Verse 3. And the people chode with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. You have to read about this, but they were, they were in sin and wickedness, and God killed, killed the people for sin and wickedness. And now they're saying, We wish we would have died with them. That's how messed up they are. Verse 4. And why have ye brought up the congregation of the Lord? They also, real quick, they also oftentimes said, were we to stay in Egypt? Were we, were we to die in Egypt? They used to say that a lot. Let's start to go over. And why have ye brought up the congregation of the Lord into, his, into this wilderness, that we and our cattle should die there? And wherefore have ye made us to come up out of Egypt to bring us in, unto this evil place? It is no place of seed, or of figs, or of vines, or of pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. You know the problem, brothers and Christ, with us for instruction and righteousness? God promises us things, and we need to be patient. We need to be patient. 
These people were impatient. They wanted it now. now. They're so fleshly, so worldly. They're coming out of Egypt, which is the type of the world. They're so worldly, so fleshly. fleshly. They want it now, now, now. I have a tree outside. It's, it's big and fat, and I call it the I want tree. Okay? It's all about me, myself, and I. I want, I want it now. Now, 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 now. Me, me, me. I, I, I. Now, now, now. The Bible says be patient. Trust the Lord with all thine heart. They're not doing it. God knows what you need of before you even ask it, the Bible says. Trust the Lord. By all means, in prayer, make supplication. Say, Lord, we need help. We need water. But they didn't do that. They automatically got mad and started yelling at Moses. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. They fell upon their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes. Speak. First time he hit it, first time. And the second time he's supposed to speak to the rock. Before their eyes. And it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, so thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. And Moses took the rod from, from before the Lord as he commanded him. See, he's, he's starting to do it right as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? Question mark. And Moses lifted up his hand, and with the rod he smote the rock twice. He didn't talk to it. He smote it. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. This is the water of Meribah. Because the children of Israel strove with the Lord, and he was sanctified in them. Remember, Moses and Aaron were chosen of the Lord. So even though those people were yelling at trying to blame Moses and Aaron, they were really striving against the Lord. you got to be careful with that. Okay? God will choose men to preach the word and to teach the word, and they make mistakes, I make mistakes. But be careful, most of the people that really fight me and attack me, they're not attacking me, they're attacking God. I'm just his... I'm just his messenger. I'm here just to preach the word of God and preach truth. Do I make mistakes sometimes? Yes. But I'm talking about the ones that vehemently attack me. They think they're just attacking me. No, they're attacking the word of God. Okay. When I line up with the word of God, they're attacking the word of God. When I make mistakes, they, they, they what do you call it? They pounce. They wait for you to make a mistake and boy do they pounce. <laughs> and they really love pouncing. Okay. But you see here, what got in the way of Moses acknowledging the Lord in all his ways? Anger. Today people say, well, because you see pe preachers preach out of anger and everything. It's like a lot of times when I've heard preachers, and they, get, they can get a little angry. I've said this before. You can raise your voice. You can be stern. You can really give it to them. But you don't lose your anger. Like get lose control because you're losing, your anger is taken over. Your anger is now in charge. And the people that preach like that, or discipline like that, they, they mess up. They do it wrong. They go too far. Okay. Now in Exodus, you don't have to turn here, but in Exodus 32, 10, you have Moses, he's up 40 days and 40 nights in the mountain. The Lord telling him how to build the tabernacle, telling him how to uh, make in the uh, stone tablet with the Ten Commandments on it. So, and then the Jewish people, they start worshiping a false god. Aaron, they throw, Aaron says, I just threw in some gold and out popped this calf. And they start worshiping false gods. And you see that Exodus 32, 10 says, Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, that I may consume them. And I will make of thee a great nation. And you keep reading, and Moses is like, Oh Lord, come on, you can't, please don't do this, Lord. What will the, the world say? Did you just bring these people out of Egypt just to destroy them? Please, Lord. And he, he's trying to plead for the people. But when you get to Exodus 32, 19, when Moses actually goes down and he, because God already saw, remember, God sees all. 
Why are we to trust the Lord with all our heart and lean not on our own understanding? One of the biggest things is, is God sees everything. God knows all. God saw what they were doing. That's why his wrath waxed hot against them. When Moses walks down, what's his reaction? Exodus 32, 19. And it came to pass as soon as he came nigh into the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot. And he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mount. Brothers and sisters Christ, sometimes you can get angry with a cause and stay focused on the word of God and you can preach the truth. You can raise your voice a little bit. You can point at people. Try to convince, get conviction. Get them under conviction. But what happens when you lose your temper? Lose it. Remember, it just says his, Moses' anger is waxed hot. It waxed hot. He was angry. I don't have this in my notes, but remember Paul with the Corinthians. He said, I hope when I come to you, I wouldn't find you as I would, because he's hearing about this fornication. It's such fornication that one would have his own father's wife. I think that I said it right. right. They're in wicked, wicked sin, just like right here with Moses, these people worshiping a, a golden calf. They're in great sin, but Paul's saying, I hope I would not find you as I would, and when I come to you, I hope that I wouldn't be as I am. Because right now, when he's not there, he's losing, he's angry. He's very angry. To the point of losing it. How could you do this? This is wickedness, this is sin. And he teaches that when you fornicate, all sins that's done is done without the body, but when you fornicate, you sin against your own body. Remember, your body is supposed to be a temple for the Holy Ghost and be without blemish. You sin against your own body. This is serious. And he was angry. And he was saying, I hope I don't come there. Why? Because Paul taught us, I'm getting ahead of myself, but he taught us how we're supposed to correct people. How we're supposed to preach to people. You don't lose your temper. Uh, Psalms. Pause the video. Turn to Psalms 106, 32. Let's actually turn there. Because this is important. People say, well, that's not really what happened with Moses here when it came to the rock. You know, it wasn't that he lost his temper. He just, you know, he just did it his way. Uh, Psalms 106, 32. Psalms 106, 32. Sure they angered him also at the waters of strife. Who's the day? The, the Jewish people coming up to him and Moses, it's your fault. Aaron, it's your fault. We don't have water. We're going to die. They angered him also at the waters of strife, so that it went ill with Moses for their sake, because they provoked his spirit. We read up there in Exodus 32, Moses' anger waxed hot when the people would, would sin against God, when people would, would complain and whine. Moses got frustrated with them. Oh, how long must I suffer these people? Jesus had the same attitude. When he came, to, he, he always say that, How long must I suffer you? Bring him here. Remember the man that, that they, they couldn't cast out the uh, devils? How long must I suffer you? Bring him here. Bring him here. And he cast him out. And his apostles asked him later, like, Why couldn't we cast him out? Well, this one only goes out by prayer and fasting. Prayer, seeking God. Acknowledging him. Prayer right? and fasting. Because they provoked his spirit so that he spake unadvisedly with his lips. Brothers and Christ, I've seen preachers that they get angry. They get frustrated. And they'll slip up and say wrong things. They'll make mistakes. And people will say, oh, they made. The first thing they need to learn to do is they need to learn to calm down when they preach the word of God. It's okay to get angry with a cause. But they need to calm down and make sure they're preaching the Word of God properly. That they're preaching truth. I've seen brethren, there was a brother in Christ that he was preaching an amazing preaching. It, uh, it was a great Bible study. We're turning here, turning there, hour-long Bible study, comparing Scripture with Scripture, using the Bible to define the Bible, using the Bible as the example of the Bible. It wasn't a talk show. Okay, it wasn't a reaction show and everything. It was a Bible study. And at halfway to three-fourths in, Something came up 
that had to do where that reminded him of attacks that he gets from the enemy. And he folded he folded the Bible and he started yelling, he started talking. He started out just talking to the camera about it, about his him getting attacks and this, and it got to the point where he started yelling at the camera. He started losing his temper. Okay? He started losing his temper. And one thing I, I remember telling that brother in Christ, I said, first of all, uh, who's listening? Who are you yelling at? Well, I'm yelling at those people that keep attacking this ministry and everything. No, you're yelling at the brethren. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. Because we're the ones listening. We're the ones with the Bibles open and following along. He had great momentum, got our attention. We had, it was an amazing study, and then we hit a brick wall. He, started, he strayed from the study, started losing his temper, and started complaining for about five to ten minutes to the point where he was yelling at the camera. And I told him, first and foremost, uh, you're yelling at us. Secondly, the Bible says that when Paul got yelled at, when Peter got yelled at, when they got whipped, when they got beaten, when they got thrown in prison, what did they do? Did they get angry? Did they get mad? No. What did they do? They praised God to be counted worthy, to suffer for his namesake and for the gospel. For this book, to suffer for this book. Praise God. Pray. That brother in Christ had a hard time praising God and giving God glory and thanking God to be counted worthy to, to suffer for his namesake. And there's a lot of brethren like that. I've probably made mistakes too. But brother says Christ, when you get angry, you stop acknowledging God in other words, doing things God's way, and you start doing things the flesh's way, the flesh starts getting in charge, and it's not supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Today we should never preach slash witness in anger or correct brethren in anger. Mm -hmm. Once again, I've seen brethren make mistakes when you, you can get angry with the cause. But when you let that anger consume you, two things we're going to be talking about, getting ahead of myself again, bitterness and anger. When your anger consumes you, what does it lead to? Hate. Hate towards people. Hate towards this book. What does bitterness do when it takes over? It leads to hate. Hate for people. The lost world. For brethren. For yourself sometimes. For the word of God. 2 Timothy 2.25 2 Timothy 2.25 Some of the brethren know this one. We use this a lot. 2 Timothy 2.25 And meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. And meekness. Did Moses use meekness? No. He didn't. Do I sometimes raise my voice? and Sometimes. But I, the Lord has hit me just as much as I'm trying to hit you, brothers and Christ, with truth. We need, to work, we need to watch out about that. I've seen brethren get so angry that they hit their Bibles. I've seen false converts, wolves in sheep's clothing, where they hit their Bibles, where they're kicking the pulpit, they're throwing things all over the place. And they're yelling at the congregation. Stay away from those people. I'm telling you, that's not of the Holy Spirit. And meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Did Moses use meekness? No. He got angry. With a cause. With a cause. But he let that anger take over. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. And meekness, brothers and Christ. We preach the gospel in meekness. We stand firm. We preach against sin. We warn about hell. That should put the fear. They should be fearful. They should fear God. You know, help them become a, a broken heart and a contrite spirit. We're serious. We speak the truth of the word of God in sincerity and in truth. But we're supposed to do it in meekness. We're supposed to do it with boldness. But with meekness too. Verse 26, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. Everyone that's lost is in the snare of the devil. Everyone that's lost, that he that believeth not is condemned already because he believed not the truth. Remember that in, in John chapter 3? They always love that John 3, 16, but they don't keep reading. He that believeth is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Neither come to the light, lest their deeds be reproved. And meekness opposing, 
instructing those that oppose themselves, if God prevents will give them the repentance, repentance, the acknowledgement of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Titus 3.1 says, Put them in mind to be subject and to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man. Now, calling out someone's sin is not speaking evil of no man, but talking about people behind their, self, behind their backs, bearing false witness, making up stories to make them look bad, that's speaking evil. Okay? But yes, you call people's sin out. Yes, if someone's not preaching properly according to scriptures, you go to the scriptures and you say, Brother, I'm pleading with you. You need to line up with the scriptures. But be careful not to speak evil of no man. To be no brawlers. This is Titus. Okay, remember 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus? Uh, Paul is, is, is writing letters to men in ministry. This primarily applies to men in ministry. But for instruction and righteousness, there's a lot in here that we could all learn from. To speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. All meekness. You can get angry with the cause, but don't let that anger control you. Don't let that anger blind you. And you start saying the wrong things. You start acting in a way that you shouldn't act. Doing things you shouldn't do. Verse 3. What gets us upset sometimes? For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish. And it's got, we're going to keep reading, but stop. When I see sin and wickedness and brethren that I struggled with, that I failed the Lord time and time with, I get angry. And sometimes your anger is not at them, your anger is at yourself. You know the number one person I get angry with? This guy right here. Failing the Lord. Uh, sometimes I, I try not to dwell in the past, but sometimes I look at my past and go, wow, the last 10 years, the first four years of my life, I've been saved for 10 years now, the first four years of my life was very rocky, very rough. There's times I'm like, Lord, why didn't I get saved sooner? And I start thinking of my lost life as a professing Christian, and I start getting angry at this man right here. When I fail the Lord, I get angry at this man right here. I do. But what happens is, is when we see it out there, we start getting angry at those people. And Paul's saying, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceiving, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, and hating one another. But after that, which, after that, the kindness of God, the love of God, our Savior, towards man appeared. God saved us, He can save them. But sometimes I think we're projecting. When we see sins that we struggled with, are probably still struggling with. You could be a babe in Christ and still struggling with the same sin and you want to get mad at them, but the number one person you should be mad at is this is your is me, myself, and I, the self-entity, as I always say, the self-entity, me, myself, and I. Okay. That's who you should be mad at first. Okay. Verse 5: Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. He saved me, he can save them. If you're lost and watching this, he could, like easy believism, you know, and you, you reject the true plan of salvation, repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. After God saves you, He gives you a new life, a new birth, new creature in Christ Jesus, the new man, new woman. Then He can save you still. It's not too late. He saved me. I was a false convert, part of easy believism. And then God showed me the truth of the, key, of the Bible version issue. And then he showed me the true plan of salvation. And I grabbed onto it and I haven't let go of it since, praise God. To God be the glory. Not because of my strength. To God be the glory. But according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing, regeneration, renewing of... Doesn't want, page doesn't want to turn. And renewing of the Holy Ghost which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. It goes back to reminding you, did God save you despite your wickedness and your sin and your filth? Yeah, yeah, he did. Then you need to plead with them and in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. 
Okay. Which he shed abundantly through Jesus Christ our Lord, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Romans, remember, be not brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Okay, and meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. Romans 10, 15, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. When you go to preach to some, whether you're correcting a brother in Christ, whether you're preaching the gospel, you're correcting a brother in Christ when it comes to doctrine, when it comes to instruction in righteousness, sanctification, when it comes to preaching, when you're correcting someone on sin, you're supposed to do it with the heartfelt that this is a good thing. What I'm doing is a good thing. I desire to see you get your heart right with the Lord. I desire to see you get back on the right, you know, the right path. I want to see you get saved and born again. Okay. But lately, when the brethren go to correct one another, it seems to be done out of hate and bitterness. And a bitterness and anger that turns into hate for your brother and sister in Christ. Some people do it because they want to see their brother, like they do it online to bring it to, they want everybody to see because they're trying, they're hoping and praying for the destruction of who it is they're witnessing to. If they're witnessing to someone's lost, are they correcting a brother in Christ? They're saying it in a way that they want to see that person be destroyed. Their heart's not in the right place. When I correct a brother in Christ, it's to see them get back up. I want to see them built back up. They're, they're broken. They're fallen. I want to see the Lord pick them back up. I want to see them get back up on their feet. I want to see them get right with the Lord. And there's brethren that have corrected me with that same heartfelt, and I have been wrong sometimes, and had to take the correction so I can get back up on my feet and be standing for what's right. The Word of God. Okay. Ephesians 6.15, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, not anger, not wrath, okay? peace. Remember we, uh, in one of the old studies we talked about the word friend. The word friend doesn't mean we're best buds, okay? that we're really close. The old Bible and the, and the, and the Old Testament, there's two types of friends. There's the friend that, and it's in Psalms, I think, or Proverbs, but there's a friend that's closer than a brother. And then there's the guy that you come across somebody um, and there's a stranger coming this way and you're walking and you look up and to keep from upsetting that stranger, you say, whoa, friend, whoa, friend. Friend meaning I'm not your enemy, the opposite of an enemy. There's friend that's the opposite of an enemy and then there's a friend that's closer than, than a brother. Sometimes today we call them best friends. I had best, two best friends in high school growing up. We did everything together. Hanging out and doing all, getting in trouble together. We, we did everything together. Uh, you have best friends. And then there's the friend, I'm not your enemy friend. Okay? We're supposed to be a friend when it comes to, we're not your enemy. I'm not your enemy. I'm here to preach peace. I'm here to teach you, to tell you the truth about your condition. And that it's not too late. I know what the cure is. I have the cure. Okay. We're supposed to be at peace, not anger. What did Moses do? He lost his temper. And if you keep reading, he got in trouble for it. It cost him. 1 Peter 3.15 1 Peter 3.15 But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. The hope that is in you, that blessed hope. I know where I'm going when I die. Do you know where you're going when you die? I got magnets on my truck that says, if you were to die today, it's either today or tonight, would you be, in, I think it's tonight, if you were to die tonight, would you be in heaven or in hell? I know where I'm going. I have that blessed hope. I'm looking for Jesus Christ. And I don't want to get off on this too much, but I'm still hammering the brethren today that are taking their eyes off Jesus Christ and getting distracted by the world. And you've got brethren in ministry that are doing the same thing. And it does, it does anger me, but I give it to the Lord. But they get so distracted by the world and their ministry went from being good, solid Bible preaching, keeping your eyes on Jesus Christ, to now talk shows and just worldly, just the world, the world, the world. Okay. We have a hope in us, that blessed hope. The day of Christ. 
the day of redemption. Grieve not the Holy Spirit whereby you are sealed into the day of redemption. Those are three titles, the names for when we get caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble. We have that blessed hope. We are looking for it and we know where we're going to go when we die or when God catches us home. We know where we're going. We have a hope in us. And it says here that the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And we're supposed to preach the truth and meekness. You're a sinner on your way to hell and you deserve to go to hell for sinning against God. Fear. Brethren, to the brethren, there's the judgment seat of Christ. There's that blessed hope. We get called up. We're all going to be standing before Jesus Christ and we're all going to get judged before Jesus Christ. And what's getting judged is the life that we lived as a Christian. Fear. I'm fearful of that time period. Do I want it to happen right now? Yeah, but when it happens, I'm going to be fearful. Jesus, the righteous judge, is going to be up there. Remember John, when he saw Jesus for the first, the resurrected Jesus, uh, when he's in his glorified body, in Revelation, what was his first response? He fell on his face as if he were dead. Fear. We're supposed to put the fear of God in people by preaching against sin, warning about hell. We're supposed to put the fear of God back into the brethren when they start failing the Lord and going to the left or to the right or getting into doctrines of devils to say, listen, someday you're going to have to answer for that at the judgment seat of Christ. Fear. But when we do it, we're still supposed to do it in meekness. Verse 16, having a good conscience. I can't see how you have a good conscience if you're losing your temper and just yelling and throwing things and getting the people to be afraid of you. That's what's really happening with some of these preachers in these pulpits and the battle buildings that lose their temper and kick the pulpit and throw things and everything. What is it? You're trying to get the people to be afraid of you. I don't want you to be afraid of me, brother, says Christ. But I do want you to fear God. Having good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, that they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation. Good conversation. And it's in Christ. Brothers, says Christ in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. Only God is perfect. He can be angry and still do everything right. That's why God can pour out His wrath and everything and still be a righteous and just God and not make any mistakes. You don't have to turn here, but Nahum, Nahum chapter 1, verse 3 says, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all quit, acquit the wicked. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. Psalms 103, 8 says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. Praise God. Save me. He can save anybody that's lost out there. Psalms 145.8, he still saves me. Even as a saved sinner in this life, I've made some stupid decisions and stupid mistakes, and I have fallen flat on my face, and God has picked me back up again. So it's not just that salvation. It's in the life of a Christian. God is still showing, has so, is so merciful and gracious and plenteous in his mercy. Psalms 145.8, the Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, and of a great mercy. Now, here's the thing. I'm not God. You're not God. Only God can do it right. But here's the question. Are we supposed to be like God? Remember Jesus said, Be holy for I am holy? Can I be perfect? No. But am I supposed to strive to do what's right and not sin against God? Absolutely. Am I supposed to strive with all my heart to do things God's way? Absolutely. Do I fail? Absolutely. That's the sad part. I'm not saying that with any pride or fervor. Absolutely. I failed the Lord many times. But Proverbs 15, 18 says, A wrathful man stirreth up strife. Someone who loses their temper. Especially someone who loses their temper a lot. A wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeases strife. We also need to be slow to anger. It's not always easy. Some brethren really struggle with it. Some brethren don't have a hard time struggling with it. But we also are supposed to be slow to anger. Now, brethren, you can get angry at yourself. 
You can get angry. There's times I go outside and I get angry at myself and boy, I just preach the hillside and I talk to the Lord and I'm complaining about this guy right here. There's times I go out there and I start preaching to the hillside in prayer and I talk to the Lord and I quote scriptures from memory that the Lord blesses me with and or I'm reading the Bible and I come across the part where I believe the brethren as a whole, I'm failing it, I get mad at me. The brethren as a whole are failing the Lord, I get mad at the brethren as a whole. I've said this before, the, the condition of the body of Christ today is, is bad. We're not doing things God's way today. House churches, bishops, deacons, ordained elders, okay, like, like what we're talking about here, instructing those in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. People are starting to get too uh, familiar, if you know what the word familiar means, with YouTube. They're starting to become YouTubers. I hope I never become a YouTuber, where it becomes about views and clicks. People like subscribing to your channel and, and how many views you get. You get to talk about what's popular in the world. You start doing drama, talk shows, reaction shows, drama fest. You become a YouTuber. I hope I never become a YouTuber. Right now I'm using this platform because it's, it's one of the doors that are open for preaching the truth. But I hope I never become a YouTuber. But I'll sit out there and I get mad at the brethren. There's times I get mad at the world, brothers of Christ, how vexing it is. I'm tell I went in to get groceries yesterday and I don't know how many times that I had to try to look straight or look down at the, at the, the wheels of the cart and everything because the wickedness and sin that's going on in this world is just it's so abundant. And the old man that was a professing Christian, that was a false convert, he had no problem with all this stuff. All the wickedness of the world, he had no problem with it. The satanic style music, there's a satanic song started playing and it's, I know this song, it started ringing in my head, I just tried to try to sing a hymn in my head over that song that was playing as I was trying to get groceries. Do I get angry at the world? Absolutely. And all three of these angers I'm talking about, I'm talking about anger with a cause. I have every right to be angry at myself. I have every right to be angry at the brethren when they're failing the Lord. I have every right to be angry at this wicked world, how bad it's gotten out there. How vexed I am by this wicked world. But in the end, in the end, you need to give that anger to God and get back to living for Him. I give the world to the Lord. He'll take care of it. That's why I warn, brethren, when you, if you're following a ministry that's so preoccupied with the world, the world, the world, you might need to take a break from that ministry for a while and get back into this, the Word of God. Okay? If you're going around watching all these channels, like I said, I, I had to limit myself to like 15, 20 minutes of looking at stuff to see what the news is of what's going on in the world because you can get addicting clicking on videos. What's going on here? What's going on here? Oh, here's, here's a debate or here's that debate, you know. You can get addicted to those things. Okay? But in the end, I gave the world to the Lord. He'll take care of the world. Brethren, I do my best to correct you through Bible studies. I, I, to point you to this as the solution to all your problems. And in the end, if you choose the flesh, the world, Satan's way of doing things, I give you, I get mad and frustrated because I've seen brethren fall away that I love and care about. But in the end, I gotta give you to the Lord and say, you know what, Lord? He's yours. We're, we're, I'm in your hands. He's in your hands. You'll deal with him just as you deal with me. And I keep praying for him. Okay. Uh, myself, I keep throwing myself before the Lord and asking for his mercy. The failures that I have. Okay. You need to give the anger to God and get back to living God. What does the Bible say? Well, that's just what you say. What does the Bible say? Ephesians 4.26 Ephesians 4.26 Be ye angry and sin not. People stop there. I've seen so many people say, Be ye angry and sin not. We have every right to be angry. As long as we don't sin. But like I said, when you lose your temper, when you lose control, you wind up sinning. Because you say something that ain't right, doesn't line up with this, or you do something that ain't right. right? But they say we can be angry and sin not. Yes, the Bible says you can uh, be angry with the cause. But what's the last half of that verse that people always ignore? Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. You know what that means, brothers of Christ? By the end of the day, you need to either get, if you're angry with, with yourself, get your heart right with God by the end of the day. Repent, remember? Uh, deny yourself. If any man come after me, they must deny themselves. 
repentance, pick up their cross daily, turning from that sin, the actual physical work of cleaning up that sin, that wrong, take up your cross daily, and then you get back to following the Lord. So if you're mad at yourself, by the end of the day, you need to get your heart right with the Lord. So at the end of the day, that anger is gone. You're back to praising God and thanking Him for His mercy, and you're back on the right path. If you're angry at the brethren, you need to go to them if it's possible to go to them and correct them with love and meekness, instructing those who oppose themselves to get them on the right path. If they get on the right path, praise God, the anger is gone by the end of the day. Let's say they don't get on the right path. What do you do? You take it to God in prayer, and you give your anger to God, and you give that person to God. You don't let the sun go down on your wrath. You don't remain angry for days on end and weeks on end. You give it to the Lord. When it comes to the wicked world, I sit there and talk with the Lord all the time and get angry about this world. But I give it to the Lord and say, you know what, Lord? I'm sorry. I'm not trusting you in all, in all my ways. Or I'm, I'm not tr trusting you with all my heart. I'm leaning on my own understanding and I'm looking at everything that's going on, and I, may, I might be getting fearful. I might be getting doubtful of what the Lord's doing. Well, why are you doing this, Lord? Why are you allowing this? I need to give it to God. When I get angry at this world, I talk with the Lord. We get into the Scriptures, and I give it to the Lord, and I get into the Scriptures. Same thing with the brethren. If I have a problem with the brethren in Christ, and there's nothing I can do to fix it, I've tried preaching truth, and they just don't want to listen to me. They don't want to listen to the Word of God. I give them to the Lord and I get back into the Word of God. And God takes the anger from me. Okay? It says here, uh, let not the sun go down on your wrath. In other words, by the end of the day, you need to give that anger to the Lord. Because if you hold on to that anger, it's going to fester. It's going to grow to the point it's like a volcano and it's going to be out of control. Same thing with bitterness. They seem to go hand in hand, anger and bitterness. When anger starts getting out of control, you realize you start getting bitter. Bitter towards brethren. Bitter towards the lost world. And God forbid you ever start getting bitter towards the Word of God. Titus 1.7 says, For a bishop must be blameless as the stewards of God, not self-will, not soon angry. Not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, and it keeps going. Not self-willed. Not my will, but thy will, O Lord. If thou will it, Lord, can I do this today? If it's okay with you, O Lord, can I do that today? Because I always try to plan things, to stay busy, because uh, you ever hear that saying, the idols, what is it they say, um, idle hands are the devil's playground? If you're idle and just sitting around doing nothing, uh, that's when Satan really tries to go after you. You need to stay busy doing good work, staying in the Word of God, doing good work with your hands that please God. Stay busy. So I'm always asking God, can we do this, Lord? Can we do that, Lord? Stay busy with them, but not self-willed. Some brethren in ministry, they start getting to the attitude, I'm doing my way. It's my way. And then they start handling the Word of God deceitfully or wrestling the Scriptures to their own destruction, trying to make it out to be, well, my will is God's will. We're the same. I'm lining up with God. No, you're not. You're trying to do things your way. You're not supposed to be self-willed. A man that's in ministry, it's all about God and His Word and doing things God's way. Not His way. But the main part for this study, not soon angry. Not soon angry. This, this, this gets pushed so much in the Bible. Don't be soon to be angry. Slow to anger. And when you do get angry with the cause, get it worked out. And in the end, if, it, if you can't, give it to the Lord. Like I said, repent, forsake, get back to the Lord, and you're not angry at yourself anymore. You're praising God for His great mercy and forgiveness. The Bible says God is faithful. If we confess our sins, God is faithful to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Get it worked out. You're angry at, the, uh, at a brother in Christ, if it's possible, one-on-one, -on -one. if it's the brethren as a whole, I try to do Bible studies to try to get your eyes back on Jesus Christ. Get you back to, into this. Hiding it in your heart and living it. To being a living witness and a verbal witness. We do Bible studies. And in the end, I give, it, I give you guys to the Lord. And I say, Lord, I give that anger to the Lord. That frustration to the Lord. 
If there's so much as a little bit of bitterness, I don't want bitterness at all to, to, towards myself, towards the brethren, towards the world. Because bitterness definitely leads to hate. When bitterness is there and it's left unchecked, it turns to hate. And you start hating yourself, not sin, not wickedness. I'm talking about you start hating yourself and you start getting into a rut where it's all about, how do I say it? It's like you're getting to a sorrowful rut where it's just, I'm just worthless. I'm this, I'm this, I'm this. And you don't get amount too much for the Lord. You got to get out of that rut. Okay? You're not supposed to hate your brothers and sisters in Christ. The Bible says time and time again, you're supposed to love your brothers and sisters in Christ. And we're not to hate the lost world. We're to preach the truth to them. That's true love for the lost world. We preach the truth to them. We come to them with the, the, uh, the, the peace, the gospel of peace, the feet shod with the preparation of peace, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. We want to see them get out of the snare of the devil and get into the hands of God. Remember Jesus talking about him and God the Father being one and the same? No man can take him out of my Father's hand. No man can take him out of my hand. I and my Father are one. We want to see him get put in God's hands and taken out of the snare of the devil that are taken captive by him at his will. Okay. Now, we're going to end this. We, I did a study. We did a study together, Brothers Just Christ, and I'm going to try to link them. And I'm going to try to figure out how to put the video. There's ways to link the videos at the end where they pop up. And there's ways to... I know how to link them in the description channel, and I can link them again in the actual comment section channel. But we did a study together, brethren, about three years ago on holding on to anger. I lost fellowship with the Brethren Christ up in, in Canada. It, months of doing weekly Bible studies together. I'd call, uh, Skype them, and we would talk any time, like any day, we'd Skype. It's, there was no specific time we could talk. We could talk any time. And we talked a lot, and we fellowship a lot. He was, a, he was, to me, he was a friend that was closer than a brother. He was a brother in Christ. But one day, he just was very angry. He was very angry. And he, got, he kept trying to start a fight with me. He kept trying to find a fault with me. He kept trying to find a, a, get me to make a mistake or something. And it just, he just was very angry. And when I finally did make a mistake... He used that as justification to blow up on me, and he broke fellowship with me, and I haven't heard from that brother since. And that, that was the motivation but to do that video on holding on to anger. There are brethren that just, they thrive on anger, just, they want to be angry. Just to be angry. I miss that brother in Christ. I still pray for that brother in Christ. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I did this study, so please go watch it, Brother Skies. If you haven't watched it, hold on to anger. We're not supposed to hold on to it. In the end, we give it to God. We're not supposed to live and thrive off of anger. And that we go more in depth than what we did here in the study. We also did a two-part series together on dangers of bitterness. My mentor started getting very bitter. The one who led me to Christ, taught me the Bible version issue, taught me the true plan of salvation, taught me how to read the Bible how to study the Bible, taught me the major doctrines, taught me instruction in righteousness. He started getting very bitter, and it started to show. Okay? And my, he won't listen to me. So I thought, well, let's do a Bible study to warn the whole brethren, including this man right here, not to be like that, to not let bitterness build up. And this, my mentor, uh, this, another brother in Christ, he can't tell friend from foe today. He can't. He's just very easy to lash out at people. But the dangers of bitterness, part one and part two, and holding on to anger. You don't have to, but I really suggest you go back and watch those videos. Might be a good time to go back and watch those videos again. The brethren these days seem really to really thrive off of anger, bitterness, that leads to drama, that leads to backbiting and whispering. That leads to bearing false witness. You get so angry, you just say something that makes someone else look bad, but it's a lie. They thrive off anger and bitterness towards everyone and anyone. And it only will lead to hating yourself, the brethren, and the people of the world. Where you're, If you hate the world, the people of the world, the way of the world, absolutely. The people of the world, you're not going to be as effective in, in witnessing for Jesus Christ. You're just not. Okay. 
So brothers and sisters in Christ, what can get in the way? One of the big things that get in the way of you acknowledging the Lord, acknowledging Him in all your ways, is when you get angry and you lose your temper. Another way you could say it was mainly for trusting the Lord, but when you start doubting yourself, self-doubt, your faith starts waning. You stop acknowledging Him. You, start, you stop acknowledging Him and looking at Him, and you start looking at all your, fa your failures and your inadequacies. If that's you, brother, says Christ, get it worked out with the Lord and start focusing on Him and trusting Him with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Don't let anger get in the way of you acknowledging Him in all your ways. Acknowledge Him in all thy ways and He will direct thy path. He'll get you back on the right path. He'll get, back, he'll get you back to living for Jesus, for Him. Okay, He'll get you back to looking for that blessed hope. So I'm going to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and my love for you. I'm preaching this out of love. My love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next video.